Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first 2022 edition of Connecting California, Solving the Digital Divide. My name is Miguel Leon, Senior Program Manager with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. I use pronouns he, him, his, and I'm coming to you from Tongva ancestral lands. I am a Latinx male with black hair combed to the side, brown eyes, black rimmed glasses, and I'm wearing a white button up shirt with tiny red and black accents and a charcoal gray coat. Before we get started with today's discussion, I would like to share a bit about the foundation. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is dedicated to ensuring that everyone, particularly our most vulnerable populations, has access to the equitable post-secondary educational opportunities that lead to meaningful careers. Our Connecting California series is but one example of a project that launched 18 months ago as part of our digital equity initiative to increase awareness of the digital divide and opportunities to close it. The series has hosted seven events zeroing in on various themes, including the history and root causes of digital inequity, the role that race plays in digital inequity, and even uplifted exemplars of public-private partnerships whose cross-sectoral efforts are making a difference for communities and people in need. Today, we highlight the role that nonprofit organizations are playing in shaping broadband policy in our state. These leaders and trusted advocates have not only grappled with the nuances and complex of a complex multifaceted issue, but also they are leading the charge to ensure that their communities never again are redlined, excluded, and forgotten. Before we, we begin the discussion, Dr. Gary K. Michelson, founder and co-chair of the Michelson 20MM Foundation and the Michelson Center for Public Policy, will share remarks and will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Michelson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the latest installment in our ongoing Connecting California series. I am particularly proud to share this stage today with a group of committed equity champions who are leading the charge in this asymmetric battle against the Goliath ISPs that continue to prioritize profits over people. In today's conversation, you'll hear from grassroots leaders who have stood against private industry, held policymakers accountable, and secured tremendous victories for their communities. Please take their stories and their lessons learned on the way to success back with you to help you with your own work. It is now my honor to present one of our most fearless allies in the fight for digital equity, Cindy Chavez, supervisor for the second district of Santa Clara County, a tireless digital equity champion she is an example of how elected officials can drive the change needed to eradicate digital inequity at the local level. Supervisor Chavez, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be with you today. And I'd like to thank Dr. Michelson and the Michelson 20MM Foundation for inviting me to speak today. I'm so proud to be part of the series, Connecting California, Solving the Digital Divide. Since 2020, it's provided an, a platform for important conversations around bridging the digital divide and ensuring that it is done equitably. My name is Cindy Chavez. I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. I represent the downtown, the east side, and the southeast side of San Jose here in the heart of Silicon Valley. 73,000 Santa Clara County residents do not have access to the internet at speeds necessary to do a Zoom, take an online class, or have a telemedicine appointment. More than 70,000 people here in the heart of Silicon Valley have no internet access at all. This is the unserved population. The underserved population is even larger. More than 680,000 county residents only have one provider where they can get a reliable internet service at modern speeds. Almost one third of the population in the largest county in Northern California is at the mercy of one monopoly. Historically, that means higher prices and worse service. SB 156 dedicates $6 billion to close the digital divide statewide, including $3.2 billion to build a nationwide open, I'm sorry, a statewide 
open access middle mile network along the state highway system, making it easier and more affordable for local government entities to provide a public option for internet service. That's why the County of Santa Clara is planning that right now. Myself and one of my colleagues, Supervisor um, Ellenberg, have brought this idea to the Board of Supervisors. If the private sector ISPs were gonna close the digital divide, they would have done it already at some point in the last 25 years. We hope to be a model for a municipally owned internet service provider, just like Chattanooga, Tennessee. In 2009, Chattanooga opened fiber optic internet services serving more than 360,000 residents. During the, the first decade of service, nearly 10,000 jobs have been saved or created and more than $1.4 billion of investment and development and tax revenue were brought to the region as a result of its existence. I want to say a very special thank you to all of you who joined the statewide push to make sure that that $6 billion was available and that we have the right laws and resources in place that allow local governments to play a leadership role uh, in making sure that we can make, that everybody has access to the internet. I want to thank all of the nonprofit leaders who played an incredible role in being advocates for making that kind of change. I particularly want to thank the Michelson 20MM Foundation, the California Community Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Southern California grant makers, and all the other partners who made this possible. The best time to close the digital divide was 25 years ago. The next best time is today. Keep up the great work. I'm so proud to work with all of you on this. I know that we're gonna see change in, in the near future, and I'm so excited about what it will mean for every Californian. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, for your leadership on this issue, for your innovative ideas in working to resolve it, and for being a prime example of how local leaders can drive positive social change. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with you in the service of Santa Clara residents uh, and all Californians. It's now my pleasure to introduce our incredible panel. With us to tell the story of nonprofit advocacy in the digital equity space, we have Ana Teresa Dahan, Senior Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Communications at Great Public Schools Now. Ana Teresa has two decades of experience in Los Angeles local government, education, nonprofit management, and politics, and has worked at all levels of management at LAUSD. She previously served as Mayor Garcetti's appointee on the City of Los Angeles Ethics Commission, and has also served on the City of Los Angeles Commission on the Status of Women and the 2021 LAUSD Redistricting Commission. Welcome, Ana Teresa. We are also joined by Elmer Roldan, Executive Director at Communities and Schools of Los Angeles. Elmer joined CISLA in November 2019, bringing with him 23 years of youth and community organizing experience and marking a new era of leadership at the organization. Prior to joining CISLA, Elmer served as Director of Civic Engagement in the Office of the Superintendent at LUSD and as Director of Education, Programs and Policy at the United Way of Greater LA. His experience includes work in advocating for positive alternatives to punitive school discipline and reducing criminalization in communities of color. Efforts that he led for over a decade in South LA as a youth organizer, fundraising manager and director of education programs at the Community Coalition. Welcome Elmer. Also with us is Gabriela Sandoval, Director of Race and Equity Policy at the Utility Reform Network, also known as TURN. At TURN, Gabriela works with community-based organizations throughout the state with a focus on communities struggling to make ends meet and communities of color. TURN seeks to build coalitions to, to improve broadband equity and access, increase energy equity and security, and to protect consumer privacy. Before joining TURN, Gabriela was research director at the Insight Center for Community Economic Development, a national think and do tank in Oakland, where the focus of her work was the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative. Previously, Gabriela was a faculty member of the Department of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the academic coordinator for the first professional midwifery school in Mexico. Bienvenida, Gabriela. Next, we have Alexis Villanueva, Economic Development Director at the City Heights Community Development Corporation. 
a graduate of San Diego State University with majors in social work and Chicana Chicano studies. Gabriela has practiced social work for 10 years, working with children and families with an emphasis on adolescents in foster care. At the City Heights CDC, Gabriela oversees initiatives that are focused on micro enterprise, business development, recovery and resiliency efforts, and policies that directly impact communities that are economically redlined and oppressed. She also leads a team of business advisors that help entrepreneurs in City Heights, a predominantly immigrant and refugee community, carry on their dreams of starting a business. Welcome, Alexis. Last but not least, moderating our panel today is Efrain Escoedo, Vice President of Public Policy and Civic Engagement at the California Community Foundation. Efrain is recognized statewide as a leading executive strategist dedicated to increasing the civic engagement of historically underserved and marginalized communities. For nearly two decades, he has worked within the philanthropic, government, and nonprofit sectors. Before joining CCF, Efrain had held leadership positions at the Los Angeles County Registrar Recorder County Clerk, where he spearheaded historic projects like the Voting Systems Assessment Project, which modernized the county's voting systems. Efrain also served as Senior Director of Civic Engagement at Naleo Educational Fund, where he helped lead the historic Ya Es Hora campaign which helped to naturalize more than 1 million immigrants in the US and contributed to historic Latino voter turnout in 2008. Efrain, mil gracias for your leadership and your presence today. Adelante, the mic is yours. Thank you, Miguel. And uh, what a tremendous honor to be amidst uh, such great leaders in the community and really at the vanguard of advancing a new era of digital equity uh, in California, and I think as California often does, uh, inspiring the rest of the country as well. And as Supervisor Chavez said in her opening remarks, uh, there is an opportunity now. Uh, we, we failed to do it 25 years ago, uh, we, but we are a much different state uh, than 25 years ago. We, we've undone a lot of the vestiges that uh, created inequities like Prop 187, we've continued to fight and advance a uh, more equitable inclusion of our communities and have reshaped what the legislature and the governor's office looks like uh, and all through the power of advocacy and community engagement. And I think uh, I'm most excited about this panel because we will have an opportunity in real time to hear how we are advancing digital equity from the ground up. Uh, as we heard from Dr. Michelson and others, there are historic investments being made in California by our policymakers, and that is tremendous. Uh, but in order to advance equitable outcomes for those policy wins, it is always critical that the voices of those most affected, both unserved and underserved, uh, lead the charge and, and really drive the changes uh, that need to happen. And what we hear from our panel is how that community grassroots centered movement is helping to now realize the promise that some of the policy wins that we all were very excited about this past year uh, lead to real equitable outcomes. And so with that, uh, we will dive right in to the conversation. We'll hear from each of our panelists, share more about their work. And after an initial round of, of conversation with them, we'll open it up and encourage uh, participants to uh, chime in in the chat, ask some questions, and we'll open it up and take some of those questions to really dive into a dialogue uh, around the issue of building the advocacy around a uh, digital equity movement in California. And so, Graviela, I want to start with you. Thank you for joining us and giving us some of your time and for the amazing work uh, that TURN has been doing uh, and not having let up for many years and decades to continue uh, to raise the issues around uh, how equity in our uh, broadband systems is, is not meeting the needs of our highest need communities. And so seeing this unprecedented uh, action in the legislature, in California government, at localities, hearing from Supervisor Chavez, uh, there is also a growing movement around nonprofits and particularly community organizations to raise their voice and really demand 
uh, for more systems change and equitable outcomes around broadband access and use. And so with TURN having been uh, such a, a steadfast advocate in this space, talk to us about how you're seeing an expansion of the movement calling for digital equity, uh, the types of community organizations and what TURN is doing to sort of help support and, and, and bring in uh, some of these organizations who maybe are not uh, directly oriented towards digital advocacy, but certainly have now brought community voice to this fight. Thank you, Efrain, and um, thank you to the Michelson 20MM Foundation for having us. Um, it's quite an honor to be um, here with you all today. So TURN, the Utility Reform Network, has been around for almost 50 years. We're getting ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. And so we've been working in the telecommunications space since well before broadband and the internet were even an issue. Um, and we work at the level of the California Public Utilities Commission. So we have a legal team who advocates on behalf of California consumers at the Public Utilities Commission. And we also do work at the legislative level. So part of what we've seen with the onset of the global COVID-19 pandemic was that a lot of our partners and a lot of organizations who were not yet our partners were by perforce um, turned into advocates for broadband equity, for digital equity in the state, right? Because all of a sudden, everyone needed internet access. And it really laid bare the needs of communities that had been affected by this digital divide that we really should have closed decades ago. And so um, we found ourselves in this tricky position of um, being an organization that had a lot of technical expertise, especially in the area of deployment. So there is a very kind of common sense conversation that takes place, right? Um, I'll share with you a story about uh, a woman named Elizabeth who lives in Fresno. We had an opportunity to talk with her um, in the midst of her children sheltering in place. She has four kids. She and her husband um, have four kids and the six of them live in a mobile home park in Fresno. And what they experienced when the shelter in place orders went into effect was that um, her kids, all of a sudden, all four of them required internet access and her community does not have reliable internet access, nor did her uh, service, the service that she had paid for before, you know, which was pretty spotty to begin with, it couldn't handle four children on, you know, online at the same time to attend school. So what some of the trade-offs that she had to make included driving all of the kids to a Starbucks, to a McDonald's, to the school grounds so that the kids could, from the car, attend virtual school. In addition to this, she, she shared with us that she often had to miss work when her kids had to take a test online because the internet service wasn't reliable enough. And so she would upgrade temporarily her telephone so that she could use it as a hotspot so that her kids could actually access the internet to take exams. Now, as you can imagine, this causes a, a lot of stress for a lot of people. We've also talked to people who were unemployed, who didn't have the luxury of taking you know, time away from work um, or who didn't have access to the internet because they were trying to find work. Um, you know, They're trying to find work online and they just, they don't have access. There isn't a reliable service. And so one of the things that we work on um, at TURN is advocating with respect to reliable, safe, and affordable uh, utility service in the state of California for everyone. And so really this has created a huge opening, a huge opportunity for organizations um, like many of, of the organizations that my esteemed co-panelists 
work for, right? Who maybe broadband advocacy was not at the top of their priority list prior to the pandemic. But again, the pandemic forced a lot of new organizations to really take a stand on this issue. And so I just wanna end by saying that, um, that TURN holds a kind of unique position because we do provide technical assistance to organizations who've never advocated at the California Public Utilities Commission. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, most people on the street, if I went up to them and asked them who the California Public Utilities Commission is and what they do, they probably wouldn't know. But this has really created an opening for um, that has allowed us to provide technical assistance to organizations, to teach organizations how to come to the PUC and advocate on behalf of their communities. And with the huge influx of funds, because there are, you know, more than $6 billion right now, um, you know, that the Public Utilities Commission is debating upon how it's going to be, this, these funds will be distributed. We don't want business as usual. We don't want the same situation that left so many of our communities behind 25 years ago. We know that if we do not center equity and especially racial equity um, now, then this, will, this opportunity will get away from us. And so that's why this conversation is so critical. Bill, I wonder if, if just very quickly on that last point, you all have been around for almost half a century. Um, looking back 25 years ago and at the moment now, uh, you mentioned there's a lot of organizations who maybe have not worked on this issue before, but are now stepping up and advocating. One, how impactful is that now? And, and, and how is this movement growing now different than what maybe was or was not in place 25 years ago? I think obviously there is an increased, a heightened awareness of just how, and you know, 25 years ago, maybe we didn't, we saw internet as a luxury, but now broadband access is a basic human need. So many of our basic necessities are moving onto an online platforms, right? I mean, some of the people most impacted by this conversation don't have access to this conversation. And so that is a very critical point, a very critical shift that took place over the last 25 years, recognizing that this is no longer, that there was a transformation. At some point, we hit a tipping point. People can't access healthcare in the same way that they can if they have access to internet. They can't access economic development opportunities, employment, education. I mean, and in some level, this is kind of like a, like, the entry level way that we now engage and especially in the context of an ongoing public health crisis. So I think, you know, there was this very important shift over the last 25 years. But in addition, I think, you know, we, you mentioned it yourself, Efrain, our state has really shifted um, in terms of its, many of its political leanings. And so I think, we have a very critical opportunity, not only because the role of broadband has shifted, but because um, the hearts and minds of so many people in the state have shifted to recognize that digital discrimination is simply not okay. And we have to do something to address it. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective, Gabriela. Ana Teresa, I wa want to go to you and in, in really build out this conversation. So as we start to think about a couple of things that Abiela said, one is um, organizations who had maybe not worked on this issue before now see it central uh, to their organizing work. But I'm just gonna be really real, right? You're, you're doing organizing uh, and you are trying to talk about upload, download speeds, you know, middle, you know, middle mile, dark fiber, all these things while folks impacted at the same time are dealing with economic fallouts of the pandemic, uh, with uh, issues around education equity and their children and, and what's happening, sort of one, what have been the ways to engage organizations when you do that? And then the second piece that I'd like for you to talk to about is, we're talking a lot about these monumental policy wins, but we all know that the devil is in implementation. 
and, and that happens at the local level. So wondering if you could talk about the work of organizing the organizers that, that Greater Public Schools now has been helping to lead in LA County. Um, give us some, some wins, some anecdotes that show this is how local community org advocacy is actually driving the implementation and impact here. Yes, thank you. Um, well, so Great Public Schools now, as our name suggests, is not a digital advocacy origin story. We actually focus exclusively on education issues in Los Angeles, particularly at LAUSD. And as you shared, we like to think of ourselves as organizing the organizers. We're a funder, an activator, and an amplifier. And we work with nonprofit organizations to collectively take action together to improve public education in Los Angeles. But then as Gabriela shared, the pandemic hit and all of a sudden education went online, but a lot of students did not get to go online. And so our, um, our organization first started with a pandemic response to kind of meet the basic needs of folks, which is through our One Family LA initiative where we were uh, uh, fundraising money to give direct relief to families. And we had convened at that time about 30 organizations to do that. Once federal and state funding and other sources of financial relief became available to families, the next big crisis was this digital divide, that it was very apparent. Um, we had a lot of similar stories of families who were going to public places to try to access Wi-Fi, were leveraging their cell phones. Even those that were, giving hot, were given hotspots lived in areas that were still the dead zones, even with a hotspot lack of digital literacy, just all of the challenges that we've all learned about over the last two years. And as a result, the organizations we engaged turned to digital equity advocacy and started by submitting letters to our school board, the city council and the county saying, you each have a role to play in this at minimum when you're dealing with service providers, ask for data. We need data so that we're able to advocate for solutions that actually meet the needs of community. We also ask for these public government entities to leverage their Wi-Fi sources that they have. So use E-Rate, open it up and, and create public Wi-Fi using the infrastructures that schools, our public libraries and other county facilities have available to them. And third, be an advocate with us. Use your power and your voice in our legislative system to also demand for digital equity in your relations with the state service, internet service providers and the federal government. And um, what we learned really quickly, we're so thankful that organizations like Turn exist because none of us are experts on the technicalities of this. Many of us have become experts on how the impact impacts our communities, particularly our Black and Latino and low-income communities, but understanding the technical technicalities is challenging. And so the role that GPSN has played is to try to be, uh, when we say we organize the organizers, it's providing the support to these nonprofits that are also taking on other major issues at the same time and helping them um, you know, we staff them so that they have the talking points, so that they have the uh, social media kits necessary to engage online. We source stories from them so that we can do communications and earn media to kind of amplify what's happening. And I think what we've really learned has been important, and I'll talk about some more recent work, but I, I also want to say that the story of going to public places or private restaurants to get Wi-Fi just because schools have um, reopened didn't make the digital pro digital inequities go away. I can tell you of a story of a family who went to a Chick-fil-A that for whatever reason decided they're no longer taking cash and that you could only pay with your cell phone if you have internet on it and you have uploaded a credit card. And this family literally could not eat at the Chick-fil-A because they weren't able, they didn't have a phone uh, that had internet. And even if they would have had a phone to have internet, a lot of families don't understand the process of accessing a credit card and then getting that credit card on a phone so that you can use it in a wireless way. And so just because our schools have reopened doesn't mean that families and children are still not being impacted. We see it with accessing vaccinations. We see it with uh, you know, accessing COVID testing that's required at our schools. You have to be able to, um, 
uh, upload results and or find testing centers. The pandemic may still go away, but you need the internet to be able to apply for college and for financial aid. You, if you're a family member looking for a job or trying to access public benefits, even if you're trying to get access to the uh, federal government internet subsidies that exist for families, you have to have access to the internet or a cell phone and you have to have time to go through a process to access those benefits. And so our work has not gone away just because schools have reopened. We realize that many of the inequities that we are trying to face in education are just made worse when people don't have access to the internet. And also there's a lot of communities that have experienced really, really difficult hardships and are very, very hesitant to uh, get, get back in person. So even for our advocacy work in organizing, engaging families on education issues, we've had to figure out ways to do this online. And so for those reasons, digital, uh, digital equity is a major uh, concern to us and the 60 organizations that we convene in Los Angeles County. Um, you asked about some what it looks like to do implementation. And so I think this is really at the core of what we all need to be focused on, especially as nonprofit advocates. We're so used to chasing the win, getting the win on the board, and moving on to the next issue. And then we wake up 5, 10, 25 years later and say, wait a moment, how come that didn't happen? And it's because we took our foot off the gas, and or we, we went on a new lane, got on a different car, and we didn't hold our governments, our leaders accountable for actually implementing those policy wins. And so through the help of CCF, we've been able to work locally to make sure that the funds that have been allocated at the state level or at the federal government are actually getting implemented locally in a way that solutions match the public need and actually address digital inequity. So an example would be at the county, Los Angeles County, um, of Board of Supervisors, we have been very active in participating not only in county supervisor meetings, but also any kind of staff public meetings that they have, not just to continue to voice demands and to get wins like a, pilot, a community Wi-Fi pilot that they are in the process of implementing, but we're still showing up at all of those meetings to make sure that they know we haven't gone away and to also be a uh, celebrate the work that they're doing. Nothing motivates people more than actually recognition. And so there's a lot to be had of not to just be focused on kind of the demands and lifting the pitchforks, but also being there to clap and acknowledge that they're doing a lot of work and that we are in this with them and we're not going anywhere. Um, it is all about the details. And so I, the last thing I'll say is, this is a great opportunity for nonprofits organization like ours to realize we don't always have to be the expert, that there's power in the collective and how are we leveraging our collective knowledge, resources, people to make impact. And this is, this is an opportunity for us to, um, those who are great at turning out people, partner with those who know what the message and the technicalities are. Those who um, know how to be effective online and develop social media kits and get that message out, need to partner with the people who have a lot of people who are gonna be able to use that social media kit. And that is how we're gonna win this. No one entity, no one person is gonna tackle this. It's us plus many more of us. And so the, the faster and quicker we learn to kind of leverage each other's uh, assets and commitments and values towards addressing this issue, the, the better off we will be and the faster we'll get to getting a solution. Because I can tell you the other side is very, very well resourced. They're all working together in tandem and in lockstep, whether you're AT&T, Verizon, they're all coordinating and talking to each other and we need to be doing the same. Thanks for, for sharing that. And, and yes, absolutely, Ana, Ana Teresa, it is, it, it is uh, certainly not um, simply about advocating for the need, it's understanding that there is an opposition uh, to some of the solutions of those needs. So thank you for raising that. I, we, so we've heard a lot about the great work um, that you all are doing, Ana Teresa, and, and recognize we're talking about LA County. This is a statewide movement, right? And, and I think um, I wanna turn now to Alexis, our, our sister further south, um, to actually, Alexis, if you could talk about something Ana Teresa really queued up, which was, 
it, it's going to take the collective, right? The collective power of all of the different folks that define who community is to make this happen. In other words, we got to work in coalition and, and we got to work together towards the systems change we want to see. In the work that City Heights has been doing, can you talk about what that coalition building is looking like to really drive change in your area, right? To say, what is it taking to move the needle in the way that LA is doing? But for you all, it's gotta look different in every place. So Alexis, wanna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about what that coalition building work is looking like, who are the stakeholders and what are you all advancing? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you to the Michelson Foundation for, for having us here and, and among all these speakers just bring tremendous knowledge um, and, and also pushing these conversations forward because there's no time like now that these come up and, and we're continuing to have them. So um, for our City Heights CDC or City Heights Community Development Corporation, we're a 40 year old organization. Um, coalition building is in our blood. So we were we actually mobilized. We were a creation of mobilization of a highway cutting through our community, City Heights. So we are actually a organization that was developed from that community building, community mobilization, and we just stayed. So now a lot of the issues that we directly put energy to are all of the issues the community comes to us and says, this is what we need help in doing. And so for the past 40 years, it's been something like having highways come through the middle of a community and you know affect health. Uh, affect education, right? Um, but also when we're thinking about economic development, we're a community of primarily immigrant and refugee, English language speakers. We speak over, I think, 56 languages now. We're a high density area. So we're talking about 100,000 folks and a really small community. So um, a lot of our issues and economic development are focused on sustainability, access to education, access to small business development, um, access to newly because of COVID access to healthcare, right? And so part of the, the, the coalition building that started um, and, and to your point, um, Efren, the San Diego landscape is a little bit different than, than Los Angeles landscape. When COVID happened, um, City Heights felt like time just stood still. Everything went immediately online. And we're talking about um, for businesses, grant applications, any information on regulations, any information on how staff need to seek help, everything went online in that area. For healthcare, all the vaccinations, all our clinics shut down, and all the ways that you can make appointments were online. Um, and our community is heavily supported by clinics. Um, and then for our education, education went immediately online, and they were handing out hardware and, and Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots, but not giving instruction on how to do any of that. Um, and they didn't do that until months after. So there was plenty of children that weren't online. Um, and then also all government services went online, right? And so like when we're thinking about communities that tend to be in the lower to middle income, a lot of their services are accessed online or through government buildings and they immediately closed down. So when I say time stopped, not only was it a ghost town when you walked into your communities because everybody was sheltering in place, but literally time stood still. No one knew how to access internet. No one knew what was happening. There was a tremendous amount of fear. And we also wanted to consider because we're such a, a community of immigrant refugee, we had a, a large number of undocumented individuals who this was probably the worst thing that could happen because they had no direction. There was nowhere to go. There was no way to seek help. And so immediately the coalition building started around, okay, first our businesses who in our community are our residents. Most of our businesses are lower to middle income for the lack of workforce opportunities. Many of them resorted to starting small businesses. So we're not talking about businesses that are making million dollars revenue. We're talking about businesses that barely make it. So immediately our businesses were concerned if they were gonna keep their storefronts. So how could we start building around? What can we do to help them survive? Um, we are a heavily service dependent um, community, so their jobs were wiped away immediately. How did they access unemployment? Because that was online. And if any of those individuals who you were serving had to access unemployment, the number was out of reach for the longest time. And so all of your answers were online. So we enlisted um, a collaborative. We have an economic development collaborative in City Heights that is consist about 60 organizations who are dedicated to economic development in City Heights. 
we enlisted those individuals to start fundraising around small business, but, th but then also enlisted a group of promotoras. And I will say this over and over, our promotoras are our connectors to the communities. Um, you know, that's that's a model that that I think because of COVID had people have jumped on that. But our promotoras went out there and they were their their main job was to talk about COVID and the impacts of COVID and how to access vaccines. But our our promotoras are our wraparound services. So they're not just talking about COVID outreach. They're talking about small business development grants. They're talking about how do you get on, how do you get online? Um, our promotoras are great. Like they have WhatsApp and they're teaching individuals how to use WhatsApp and how to text where these food banks are. And so again, I, you know, to your point, Efren, I think it was a matter one of education. Where can we get everybody in one space? And we had to do this in person. I'll be hundred percent honest. All of our business advisors, all of our, our programs, when everybody went remote, we stayed in the community. We made sure that our community, that our staff were safe, but we knew that we weren't gonna reach our community members going online and trying to access online services. So that meant that we were more community navigators. Um, so we did um, business walks and then we did um, education walks. Our promotoras were out there handing out um, PPE, PPE to businesses. Um, and honestly, just being one of those you know, quote unquote, first responders out there, just speaking to some of the fears that were happening, we managed to get individuals interested in what we were attempting to do and what we were hoping to do in policy. Um, I will say real quickly, San Diego's landscape when it, turns, when it comes to policy, at least at the city level, we're a strong mayor. And so that means, uh, that means a whole lot of things. But for us, that means that the mayor has to be on board with some of these concerns in specific districts. Um, and he has to see it as a priority. And I say he because our mayor is currently a male. Um, and digital equity was not at our forefront. It was not at the top of our list, but immediately when time stood still, that had to be at the top of our list. And so um, the immediate city response was Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, and to Gabriella and Anna's, um, uh, to, to some of the things they touched on, infrastructure isn't in place in San Diego and all the regions. And I, and I wanna be clear about this, right? Like when we talk about the issue and Gabriella, you talked about this, we understand that rural and tribal communities are suffering as well with no connectivity, but it is absolutely unacceptable that our urban communities are suffering just as much. And we're having an expectation that they still play a participant in our democracy and our economic system. Um, and it's and to me, it's smoke and mirrors because that's saying that there's there's ability to do that, but we know that there's not, especially when we're talking about Wi-Fi infrastructure or internet infrastructure. So, um, so we, they started with Wi-Fi hotspots. I think there was a couple in City Heights, at a McDonald's, definitely at the library. Um, but I also found that unacceptable to tell families in more affluent communities, um, please stay safe in your homes, shelter in place. But your community, please leave your home, not shelter in place. Go to a library that's not open, but feel free to stick around in the parking lot and use that Wi-Fi hotspot. So it was, it was hurtful, it was harmful to our community. Um, and it just motivated us to continue to push further. Um, so we, this year, we've decided to play a part in the budget process and to at least put it in a letter to policymakers, right? And that's a little bit different than lobbying because we will look at what that looks like, but just to play a part in the budget process, understanding where our money goes, right? And saying that digital equity is great and you wanna put Wi-Fi, that's fine, but where's the infrastructure? Where's the money towards infrastructure? Where's the money towards broadband? Where's the money that's that should be designated towards our district? And um, to be honest, that's engaged a greater conversation in our community. And we're hoping to do a community broadband pilot really soon. And I will say this confidently without the support of the city and without the support of the county. And I say that because we know that the mobilization in the community, we know that the power in the community is gonna come forward and push this forward. And the result will be that our community will be connected and then we can have, to Anna, to your point, the data to show this is an issue. This is where we need to stand up and say that this community deserves this. And again, there's, there's many communities in San Diego that this is the case of. And I want to be clear about that. That's not City Heights, right? This happens all over the state. But in San Diego, there's many communities that are trying to understand that. We're trying to educate more on what infrastructure looks like, the cost, the idea that there's sustainability in broadband. And we don't look at those models because we don't want to look at those models because our friends are ISP providers. So anyway, that's I, I can go on and on about that, but but I hope that gives a little bit of context. It does, and really, really appreciate that, Alexis, and and 
and we've got your back and, and more power to to community uh -huh. and in moving forward and envisioning things like uh, community broadband, even if the city and county don't yet have that vision and aren't, aren't moving it. I, I want to, I know there was a question in the chat and just want to quickly hit on it and anyone on our panelists, feel free to, to correct me, but there's a question asking about promotoras. Uh, maybe there's an, there's um, sort of a little bit more to explain on, on what are, who are promotoras and I'll just quickly share because I want to move on to Elmer is uh, promotoras are, can also be thought of as like community navigators, sort of these credible messengers that are from and within community uh, that have strong connection and credibility with community that help with a lot of navigation. As And we heard Alexis give the examples of that, connecting to resources, directing, providing information that is often crucial um, in, in our work. They're also referred to as promotora models. They're out promoting and providing information. Um, Elmer, I wanted, uh, uh, turn to you because we've talked a lot about, and uh, Ana Teresa talked about it as well, Alexis does a great job of visualizing it. And that is sort of on this issue, what does the direct organizing look like, right? Communities in school also, like many of us here, was not in the business of advancing uh, digital literacy or equity. Uh, it became a need, we've all uh, heard that. But then sort of, what does the organizing look like? I know the immediate need was, I need hotspots and devices, and a lot of us work collectively to address that, but how have you evolved that to now sort of do organizing that starts to address the systemic issues, the infrastructure part? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Efrain. And uh, you know, you took a lot of the, the points that I, you know, I wanted to make, and that is that an organization like ours, we have 15 years of experience in providing direct engagement uh, with LAUSD students via case management. Our work spans five communities, uh, 14 different schools. In a traditional year, we serve about 12,500 students. And during the pandemic, we provided 900 with intensive social emotional support as well as financial support. Um, and it was through that foundation that we were able to pull families in when in the, the onset of the pandemic at a time when many uh, many institutions closed their doors um, as you know the the pandemic uh, began to uh, you know shut down society um, and and you know and the fact that CISLA is having this conversation about internet equity tells you that California has a broadband problem. Uh, this is not our area of expertise. If you would have asked me two years ago if this would have become uh, one of the central topics for our advocacy, I would have said no. Like that's just not an area that we understand or, or know how to navigate. Um, nor is it our area of expertise. And like you said, you know, our work in this started very basic, and that is that from day one of the pandemic shutting down schools, we started to distribute food and hygiene supplies to our families, and then we progressed to uh, distributing noise canceling headphones because we wanted to help students reduce the noise in crowded homes, um, uh, help them get more privacy and focus as, as uh, Zoom became the, the mode for uh, taking in education. Um, and then it evolved into uh, getting devices in the hands of students, helping families navigate the free or low cost packages that were being made available. But we tried the free packages and we hit walls where we saw that they, they were actually not free. We tried uh, the paid internet and we hit walls. We actually have a case where in Watts, we got a, a donor who wanted to pay for the internet of families for a whole year. So we helped two different families from the same school, same middle school, um, try to get a package, an internet package in their community. The, the kids live two blocks away from one another, literally, two blocks we we you know we did the distance and uh, one kid was being offered the package at $65 that was the most affordable package that they could get and they could you know they actually got like a, you know pretty decent um, internet speed the other kid got offered the exact same package the exact same price for only a fifth of the internet he couldn't even log into 
the Zoom uh, class with the video on because his system would shut down, um, let alone be able to do other things like navigate Netflix and things like that. So I, I bring all of that because, uh, you know, what it, it slowly surfaced was that we needed to understand why it was so difficult that in a place like Los Angeles, which is a major urban city, right? Like we knew that in rural communities, you know, the infrastructure wasn't there, but how is it possible that in Los Angeles, you know, where families were less than a mile away from the central hub of where the, you know, the, the Western hemisphere gets its internet, kids in South Central and in Watts and Boyle Heights weren't able to access their, their own schoolwork because they didn't have enough internet. And so first is the shock, right? So I think that's, that's the first thing that, you know, that, that brings us into this space was the fact that, you know, we wanted to help families and we felt the desperation for them because, you know, if, if we who are, are a little bit more computer illiterate and internet literate were having trouble navigating these spaces, you can only imagine the level of frustration and helplessness that our families were facing, especially those who didn't have a computer at home who uh, felt intimidated by even turning on a computer, uh, let alone uh, na you know, navigating internet service provider, uh, customer support specialists, who in some cases were giving our families very rude responses um, uh, after they reached out to ask for, for help. So um, the fact that the, the, you know, that the, the pandemic elevated the economic and education inequities for students in Los Angeles um, is something that we have to hold on to. So what it what it taught an organization like ours was that direct service wasn't going to be enough. That we know that we can help a thousand families, but the reality is that the problem was much bigger, and so we needed to engage. And that's where we launched our our own organizational wide uh, initiative. Um, you know, focusing on elevating the fact that this is this is a problem, right? Like, so it starts with that is ringing the alarm and saying, hey, folks, we have a problem. Hey, city leaders, we have a problem. So we started to engage uh, folks at the city level, whether it was the mayor's office or city council members to say, you know, we know that you know that there's a problem. So what is the solution that the city is going to propose? And then went to the school board and did the same thing and said, hey, school board, we know that you're doing a great job distributing laptops and hotspots, but we need a more permanent solution. What is it that you're going to do to invest in that problem? And the same uh, with the L.A. County and even um, learning that there's a, a you know, a, a, you know, a, 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 an entity called the CPUC. Again, this is an area that you know we are we are having to learn a lot about what California is doing uh, to make internet accessible to folks. So we started with you know the 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 basics, and that is doing our research and figuring out who has the power, who has the influence um, to provide families with the the quality internet that they need. And then we started advocating to them, sending letters. We contributed to motions and resolutions and gave testimony at the meeting so that we could carry the voice of our families to them. Um, the other big action that we did was uh, in October of 2021, uh, we, along with GPSN, the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, uh, Alliance for a Better Community, um, and United Parents and Students, um, uh, we brought together a, a group of organizations to, or, you know, to, um, uh, at, at an event that we called Death to Internet Monopoly. So it was, uh, it was a Halloween theme uh, event where we dressed up as Grim Reapers. Uh, we took a casket, like a physical casket out there, filled it up with uh, laptops and hotspots. Um, and we went to the AT&T headquarters and we said, hey, you know, internet service providers, right? like you all have, the, the power to change the direction that we are moving in when it comes to internet access. And you, you really are the ones that are, that are the gatekeepers now because government is trying, but we know that with your influence, you're preventing uh, elected officials from doing more. We know that families are really disempowered, right? Like you, can, you can't pay your way out of an infrastructure problem. 
because, you know, and I speak as someone who lives in South Central Los Angeles, I used to pay $65 for my internet and, and, and it would just, my kids were always frustrated because we couldn't have two computers running at the same time. So I too have experienced that. And so all of that to say is that the organizing starts by um, bringing the stories of the families and humanizing this infrastructure issue that we have, that we can't continue to operate uh, in, in a system, in a society that tells families that only those that just happen to live in the right community or just happen to be able to afford internet can have access to the, you know, the virtual world. Um, and so for an organization like ours, we won't stop being involved in this. If anything, this pandemic and these conditions have forced us into this space. Um, and we see that us ignoring the infrastructure issues is, is, uh, is really telling kids and society that we stand to repeat these same problems again. Like if you think about what happened in Texas when they had the, you know, that big, the big freeze, right? Like they, they discovered abruptly that they weren't prepared to take on, uh, you know, a, a, a disaster of, you know, of that magnitude. Just because the sun came out doesn't mean that the problems went away in, in those communities. So the same thing, you know, is, is what we are facing here in Los Angeles. Just because schools have reopened doesn't mean that our children uh, have the, what they need to do their homework, to do their research, and to engage in the world that we are living in. You know, we're talking about the meta universe, but kids can't even access Netflix at home. Like think about the disconnect and the message that we are sending children about what we think about their place in the world when in a place like Los Angeles, we still haven't done enough to bring them into the 21st century. So, um, you know, so the, the, the call here today is to invest in organizations like GPSN that is, that is building the capacity for organizations like communities and schools uh, in, in order for us to continue to advocate and not only be the spokespeople for families, but we actually will uh, have started to invest in parents and students uh, gaining a, a sense of agency themselves for them to elevate their own voices and tell their stories and, you know, and, 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 and really act as the moral barometer for elected officials and for the internet service providers to invest more and to put away greed and, and, and put more emphasis on giving students access to uh, 21st century technology and broadband connectivity. Well said, Omer, thank you so much and, and for really connecting it. And we're gonna, uh, we've got some questions and I'm gonna move to those. I wanna do a couple of things. Uh, first is I know that we've focused a lot on uh, small business impact and education and wanna uh, give a shout out to Davis Park who also reminds us and wanna bring in the fact that uh, this also affected older adults as well in, our, in many of our low income and communities of color. Um, when telehealth moved uh, to digital, and Ana Teresa brought that in mentioning vaccine, but uh, older adults were disparately impacted uh, absolutely uh, with this and being able to access critical services and, and health that were life and death uh, for many of our older adults, right? So I wanna just acknowledge that. Uh, the other is just as we open it up to, to the panel and unless Miguel's help on any, any questions we have from the audience, just want to point out two things that I think are very important. And Elmer, appreciate your call to action, which is I think the organizing and organizing of the organizers have really brought the voices of the most affected definitely to this issue. But what they've also done is I think for many of us identified uh, some of the root causes, right? And, and we've said infrastructure a lot, but uh, what I hope many of you heard in these stories is that this is this is not a connection problem. This is not a problem to being able to subscribe to the internet. This is not a simply a problem of uh, lacking a device. Uh, 
uh, when we say an infrastructure problem, this is a, a, an inclusion and empowerment problem that is addressing the fact that um, in LA County, the west side accesses their internet through fiber. Uh, in the south and east sides, we have to use cell towers, right? Uh, that is infrastructure. And, and, and that is where the problem is and limits opportunity, uh, power to decide our own digital destinies. And so what you hear in these stories have led to the realization that that is the problem, that part of the problem is infrastructure. And we heard it uh, from Elmer's own experience and others. And so as we uh, dive into this conversation, uh, let's be cognizant of that. So it's not really a problem of the unserved. Uh, it's really a much deeper problem than that. Uh, so I, there was a question in, in, in the chat, and maybe this is for our friends at Turn Graviela and, and all the panelists, which is, uh, so in this current moment with so much advocacy growing, uh, where are the knowledge gaps and resource gaps? Like what, what, could, be, what could be supported uh, also to fill some of that? So Graviela, did you wanna uh, uh, chime in to that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this goes to some of the other questions that were in the chat as well. But so I want to just lift up a couple of things that people folks said, the stories, we need those stories, like a lot of especially our decision makers, they get bombarded with stats. And Efrain, I think you mentioned it, it's so important to put a human face on this. So even though we've heard a lot of the stories, there are plenty of stories we have not yet heard. So we, we absolutely need those stories. Um, I think Ana Teresa and Alexis both mentioned data. While it's incredibly important that we get better data about who actually has access, we also have to recognize and we have to really start to push the internet service providers. We don't know how much it costs them to provide a service, and yet they're charging us inordinate amounts of money for a service that is often unreliable and inadequate to the needs of communities. So in addition to not knowing how much it actually costs to serve communities, we don't know the, uh, the number of disconnections, right? Plenty of people were disconnected during the pandemic because they could not afford to pay their bills. And so we don't have any idea how many people can no longer access an account because they have outstanding debt. And then speaking of debt, that's another very important gap. We don't know how much debt is owed by, by um, broadband customers to the ISPs. And this is critical. We've seen this in water utilities. We've seen this in energy utilities. The state government and the federal government have been able to support customers affected, consumers, California residents affected, um, by an inability to pay their utility bills, their energy bills, right? Many people have gotten, we've got all sorts of new sources of support, state funds, federal funds. Well, guess what? There's no, no funds for broadband debt. Yes, you can sign up. And several of my panelists here, co-panelists here have mentioned the difficulties in signing up just for a discount. But if you've got a ton of debt, and you can't even open an, a new account or you've been disconnected, what, how do we help those folks? So that's a very, very critical um, gap in data that we don't have. And um, I'm gonna stop there and see if any of, anybody else wants to add something for now. I, I do wanna, I do wanna jump in because I think there's, there's two important points to make. I, I think the question also came from like, from service providers, we need, we need this information, your rate information, signing up in multiple languages. It is not available in Spanish. It is not available in other prominent languages that are spoke in Los Angeles or in California. And so having people access whatever is being offered is already, forget not having the connectivity or the time, but even just accessibility with language. And that's just very important. So I think that's, that's an important ask. And I think I just also want to underscore this difference between unserved and underserved and the power of data of really showing who's underserved. Because what typically happens in these conversations is that a map is put up and you see who has internet and who doesn't. 
And then we automatically start talking about those who don't have it. But if we had data to show quality, cost, um, all the other factors mentioned by other providers, like the debt, what type of households, you know, we, we've learned, we, I don't know if we've talked about like cyber redlining, but many people are familiar with like housing redlining. It's also occurring, but we can't make that argument without the data. And that gets to underserved. And so this really impacts populous cities of major city centers, because it looks like on a map that there is connectivity. But as you dig deeper, as Efrain and Elmer have shared, um, you, South Los Angeles looks very different than West LA. Uh, within blocks, within houses. And so this is why data is important. So we can talk about underserved. And then we could talk about the race issue and an income issue, because then we'll also see that these divides come up in that way. And the cost is also very different depending on your race and your income. And so I think these, this is why data is so important because it's not as simple as just saying, I can connect to internet or not. Any other any other thoughts from folks? I, I, I will share to this point and, and sort of just adding to what we're what what we're needing to reverse, right? And and why we need serious investment, why we need to engage our regulatory bodies and policymakers is that from a purely economic argument, when we at the foundation we're trying to learn more about the problem and why certain things exist, and we're asking about infrastructure. We had an ISP provider try to explain to us, well, you know, the reason there is fiber in, in, in some communities and not others is um, it just doesn't make economic sense uh, to put fiber in certain communities. And so um, until that is changed, uh, if, if it's a pure business decision, it doesn't make business sense. And I think what we're hearing from the panel today is, is it's not, this is not a business sense industry cluster market share conversation. This is a civil rights, uh, digital equity, kind of human need conversation um, that can be driven by those kinds of economics, right? So um, any other questions, Miguel, am I missing a question? Brother would invite you to uh, chime in. I know that the chat's blowing up right now, but in the interim, anything else our panelists want to share to some of the questions that have come up? Yes, Efrain. I just wanted to let everyone know that we have a, there is a story bank Google form for folks who want to share the stories. We're also trying to work on getting a print version of this for folks. But if you, um, so because we know oftentimes even just accessing a Google form is difficult still for a lot of our organizers. So, but in the, until we get that together, I'm dropping the link now in the chat of the Google form. You can fill out if you have stories. Uh, the California Community Foundation in partnership with, with GPSN is collecting these and will work with those entities to kind of find opportunities to uplift those stories, both in earned media, but as well as to elected officials. And we're also working on a Spanish version as well. So that is now in the chat and I'll drop it again um, to share your stories. So let, let me ask a, of the panel also, because the, the theme of this panel is around harnessing the advocacy of our communities, right? So if we're thinking about that, and for those of us engaging with different uh, community organizations and community leaders, um, where would you say right now, leading up, say, to the next several months, um, where is the advocacy needed? What, what should people be looking at right now that is critical uh, to to the work in advancing digital equity. Elmer, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say continuing to put pressure on elected officials to keep this front and center. Uh, elected officials have a bully pulpit. They have a platform platform from which they can uh, continue to uh, you know keep this conversation public. They obviously have access. To, uh, to funding that they can that you know that they can in include in the conversation but elected officials are all also persuaded by the internet service providers it, directly or indirectly and so we need elected officials to stand on this on the side of communities and on the side of their constituents 
uh, in, in order to advance this fight, which as we've all seen has, has been really difficult to advance because the internet service providers have the upper hand. They control how much data is released to the public. They control how they choose to uh, bundle packages or how they make uh, you know, it, you know, the, the, the internet available to folks uh, for lack of a better, more technical way of saying it. Uh, but also they choose, they control the narrative right now. So, you know, the, you know, the, the notion that there just isn't enough internet to go around because, you know, there, you know, the, the, the infrastructure uh, issues uh, are beyond anyone's uh, ability to fix is convenient. Right, because then you know, as long as they control the narrative, they, and and they and they uh, rule with secrecy, then it's harder for folks to have an educated conversation about redlining and about these other issues. So elected officials really do um, hold a, you know a powerful post because they can shed light on, on a lot of these uh, challenges that we've been discussing here today. Thank you for that. And I see Graviela, then Alexis. So I just want to say, along with the individuals at the kind of local level, we need individuals as well as organizations at the CPUC level. So the CPUC right now is saying, you know, they're requesting public input through the broadband infrastructure deployment proceeding. You know, they want input. They get tons of input, again, to Elmer's point tons of input from the internet providers, right? They get tons of input, paid input. They have, the, the industry has so much money to give to their attorneys to come to the PUC and make, argue their case. Well, we need the GPSNs and the CISLAs and all, you know, City Heights, CDC to come and join us um, to learn how to become formal parties to a proceeding so that your and your um, constituents' voices are heard at the Public Utilities Commission. Again, they're debating currently $6 billion, middle mile infrastructure, last mile infrastructure. And again, like I think TURN is committed to serving as a resource and as an advisor to your organizations and those of the attendees online. Um, contact me. Call me up. I'm happy to drop my contact information here. I'm sure that it will go out with, you know, follow up information. Um, it's such a critical place, and there are very few voices, right? There are very few individual voices, and it tends to be the usual suspects um, in proceedings. And this is a critical place where community can intervene where, uh, you know, if you, you can sign up at the TURN website and that's just turn.org forward slash actions, you can sign up for action alerts and you will hear from TURN as an individual or as an organization about opportunities to provide public comment at CPUC business meetings, to provide public comment at public participation hearings. Um, we will work with organizations to convince the PUC to hold public hearings in your communities. This is critical, but as I think it was Ana Teresa who said earlier, if we're not all pulling together, it's the opportunity, this amazing opportunity that we have right now, where there is actually movement, significant movement to potentially close the digital divide, it will slip out from under us. Um, so, so yeah, please, like I will put information in the chat, contact me, contact my colleagues. We want to work with, you know, we are grass top. So we're, we want to work with the organizations that are organizing and that are organizing the organizers. So um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, uh, Alexis. And then we have a couple other questions we want to share. So. Yeah, I think it starts with, with the education and outreach. Um, you know, I, I think there are organizations and specifically in, in San Diego that have no idea that there's no infrastructure, that have no idea that, you know, ISP providers play such a huge role. Um, and digital discrimination, right? And so I think when we got involved in the budget process and asking more questions around why the money goes where it goes um, and specifically why we're investing in Wi-Fi hotspots, um, what are some of the other options? I think that kind of opened individuals' eyes 
But what I really want to pinpoint in that is there's a lot of organizations where this is at the heart of what they do and they want to be more involved, but the capacity of these organizations is very limited. And so this is kind of a call to the funders. A lot of times when we talk about these, these individual organizations who are doing great work, and in particular in City Heights, we have a ton of organizations who understand how to work with this community of 50 plus languages who understand and have built trust with these, or with these communities. And they don't have the capacity to go out there and, and, and talk to policymakers and to organize around this issue, even though they understand that it affects them, even though it understands that they that their clients need this assistance. So the, the call to funders, when you're when you're funding these organizations, think about operational costs, think about staffing costs, thinking about the idea that there is needs to be capacity to go to these policy meetings. Um, because what I have seen and the most of the time when, when they come to, to us, it's because we have the time to do it. We have the capacity to do it. But I would love for those organizations who have three or four individuals who are super passionate about these issues and the clients that are sitting next to him, next to them to be at the table talking about these same stories because that's so important and because it is passionate for them. So, you know, that, that's a shout out to the, to the funders. Thank you for that uh, call out, Alexis. And, and from the from the chat, want to bring in a question that asks, with, with the unprecedented investment that we've seen on the part of California, and as you said, Graviela, CPUC is playing a key role in sort of driving or directing those investments. There's a question on outcomes that says, how can these investments maybe increase the number of ISPs in the market to sort of reduce some of the monopoly that exists? Uh, in California, or or how could these investments just change those monopolies? Well, I think several of my panelists, my co-panelists here, have talked about municipal, you know, municipal service, but also there's a local agency technical assistance fund. Um, this is fifty million dollars. Um, it's a fifty million dollar grant program to reimburse eligible local governments and tribal entities to work um, for work that facilitates last mile broadband infrastructure to communities. Now, mind you, this is unprecedented. This has never gone to local agencies before, and um, we are seeing movement here. Now, again, this is another place where the big organizations, the big entities, they're already organizing their membership member organizations to snatch up that $50 million. Because when you think about it, $50 million is not that much money. So this is a critical moment where organization, other small local entities who are interested can get, can tap into some of the coalitions that are growing to access some of that technical assistance to, to be able to, you know, to come to the CPUC and make the case for accessing some of those funds for your communities. And we're especially concerned with the communities that have been left behind because those big organizations, they don't, they don't necessarily care about equity. Right, they've been doing business as usual for 50 years or however long they've been in existence. So we are very concerned that the smaller organizations that have recently become interested that are becoming important players in addressing the digital divide also have um, reasonable access to these funds because it can make a huge difference, especially for the smaller scrappy organizations that are truly addressing the equity issues involved in um, in access to broadband. Gabriela, these local entities or that pot, is that, is that, that's not intended just for governments. Is that also inclusive of potential entities that are nonprofits or other type of, of um, entities? So there, it's it's a little bit complicated. I think it's primarily local governments and tribal entities, but there are other agencies that can get involved. And there's also a way in which the um, like uh, smaller organizations can partner with larger organizations to access the funds, or can partner with their local governments to access the funds. So we have been instrumental. Turn has been instrumental in. Um, asking or you know well i won't say demanding we've we've been very uh you know diplomatic about this but we have said to the puc look you have to take equity into account here because otherwise the funds will just go to the usual suspects again and and nothing you know the the questions around the digital divide and the underserved and the unserved will not be addressed if you allow this to just kind of you know be business as usual 
Thank you, Ana Teresa. I, I wanted to uh, just address something that may not have been explicit, but was very implicit in what Gabriela was talking about, which is when there are these opportunities and how folks, especially on the ISP side, the big ones organize, they actually oftentimes leverage nonprofits to be their spokespeople. And I would be remiss to not have a conversation about nonprofits and not mention that that happens. We all, as nonprofits, we are all working to fundraise money. And oftentimes that those that includes corporate donations. And we've all have hunted down the community relations officer at these entities that give out funds. But I, I now because there is this momentum and there is a lot of nonprofits working on this, the other side realizes that they also need to organize the organizers and they're trying to target nonprofits. And many nonprofits don't realize that no one comes and says, oh, the reason we need you is because we're trying to actually protect this financial interest. They come and they'll say, um, the government is investing an unprecedented amount of money. Wouldn't, don't you agree that that money should go directly to the people that you work with? Doesn't that sound like what should happen? And then, of course, someone who's really busy and cares about the people that they work with would say, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sign me up. I'll do that. But what they don't realize is that when we advocate for subsidies that go directly to people, that's not solving the problem because of these underserved issues that we talked about. It is just potentially a band-aid and actually it becomes very dangerous for some of the people that you're working with because oftentimes when those subsidies run out, those service providers will move your people not into a low cost plan, but to the default plan that works for them. And then that also leads to like debt accumulation, which leads to what Gabriela talked about, which is once you have debt and there's no program to get rid of that debt, you can't access internet until that's cleaned up. So I, I have my daughter with me. Um, so that is all to say that we, we, um, we, we have to be wise about the investments and supports that we're taking. It's difficult because we all, in nonprofits, we live and die by those donations. But this is a moment in time where we have to really consider what it is that we're advocating for and just do a little bit more homework and take advantage of the opportunities to learn more. Great. Thank you, Ana Teresa. And welcome to your little one. Uh, always a treat. That's one of the perks of, of remote work. We get to we get to meet the whole family. Um, so, just want to we're we're wrapping up and winding down our our panel. But because it it's a great opportunity when we have this much uh, great uh, leadership and expertise on the panel. I want to ask one more question that came in the chat because data was so prominent in all of your comments, and that is. Um, uh, one of our participants asked how the required state broadband maps as part of the IIJA will illustrate the actual number of underserved. Will, will these map, do these maps provide data that we need for advocacy or will they not be enough? That, that's for any of our panelists who, who can share some thoughts well, on that. I can share a little bit. Um... I think they will help, but I think that no one source of data, and, and this includes maps, right? Um, there are so many tricky ways that the ISPs use. Like one of the stories that we heard over and over again had to do with families who negotiated with, I, I won't name, name names right now, uh, but negotiated with a particular company to get a certain speed of access. And so, and they were, you know, they were oversold oftentimes. They were marketed, very expensive service and, you know, families out of desperation to keep their kids online or to access employment agreed to pay these exorbitant rates for very high-speed internet, but then they weren't given high-speed internet. So sadly, the mapping data doesn't show that, right? So, and this goes to one of the questions, you know, this is such a complex issue because it has to do with like, first is their cultural relevancy. Like, do people actually, you know, I see this a lot with seniors, a lot of my, the seniors in my family, my, my parents are immigrants. My mom is like, what do I need internet for? I don't need internet. Right. So first you got to overcome that, that cultural relevance problem. And then you have to 
overcome the digital literacy problem, the access to technology. Then there's the infrastructure issue, right? So again, like there's layer after layer after layer. There's affordability. There's, you know, any number of, of, of issues that crop up. So this is a very multi-layered onion that we're trying to peel, a very multi-layered issue that we're trying to resolve. And, and one, of the, one of the things, you know, I've been using internet forever. I didn't even know that you could go online and test your speed, right? So folks need to be able to say, like, I'm paying for X number of, you know, we get sold this, I don't, I don't know what this many gigabytes or megabytes or whatever are, right? Most people don't necessarily know. So you're sold a certain amount, but then guess what? Sometimes they don't give you that amount and you actually have to complain. But in order to know you have to complain, you have to be able to measure your upload speeds and your download speeds. I mean, it's just like a never ending, um, you know, never ending layers that we have to peel back. And so, yes, absolutely. The maps at, and there's all sorts of different um, mapping and mapping of data projects that are going on right now, critical, right? But we also have to address those places in which the ISPs or other entities kind of, you know, they, they, slip one past us and, and we need to be able to address that as well, right? So there's just, again, to Ana Teresa's point, if we're not all pulling together and we're not addressing this on all the different, at all the different layers, it's a problem that will get away from us. It's an opportunity that will get away from us. Such a great point, Gabriela, to, to the importance, not only in this, in this movement, but we've seen it all, right? Many of us in other movements is it's great to have uh, research produced by agencies. Uh, there's a lot of power then after that in filling in the gaps through community-led and community-driven research, which is so critical. And that's kind of your, thank you for highlighting that. Well, we've come to the end of our panel and I, I first want to just express my tremendous gratitude in you all letting me uh, be part of your conversation and gratitude for the tremendous work you all are doing in, in sort of uh, helping to drive what is a once in a generation opportunity uh, around digital equity. And as Elmer said, um, definitely a must do if we want to ensure uh, the inclusion of our next generations in what is becoming a more and more digital world. Uh, so want to express gratitude for that and also share that uh, we look forward to and hopefully all of you in this call uh, to uh, becoming allies uh, working in solidarity and as Ana Teresa said, in the collective uh, to get this done. So thank you again uh, to all of you in, in, in the work that you're doing now and that you will be doing in the coming uh, years. Miguel, brother, I will turn it over to you and also thank you and uh, Michelson uh, 20MM for this ongoing space and for including me in it. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Efraín, and thank you to all of our amazing panelists for sharing, you know, your wisdom, your expertise, your stories, your tenacity, passion, and love for community is truly driving this movement toward a digital equity for all Californians. Thank you so much. Uh, the power of advocacy, how nonprofits are shaping broadband policy in California, was presented by the Michelson 20MM Foundation in service of advancing digital equity for all students and families. We want to thank our foundation partners, the California Community Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and Southern California grant makers. We'll post the recording of today's discussion on our YouTube channel, the Michelson 20MM Foundation, by tomorrow. Uh, the video will include links in the description so that you may join the Connecting California LinkedIn group, uh, a dedicated space to foster collaboration in California to advance digital equity and close the divide faster and together. If you or your organization want to become part of our digital equity work, please reach out to me personally at miguel at 20mm.org. You can also stay engaged by signing up for our newsletter at 20mm.org uh, to receive news and updates about Connecting California, as well as our other events and programs. A special thank you to all the nonprofit organizations in our audience who work tirelessly every single day uh, to make a difference for students. Thank you for always being our guides in this work and our inspiration for staying focused and on task. Uh, if you're new to the digital equity policy conversation, you heard today how you are needed now more than ever to stay engaged and get involved. Uh, every little bit helps against uh, industry goliaths. 
Thanks again for taking the time to join us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next Connecting California event. Take care and have a great rest of your day.